Thank you for joining with me again. Um, we're very grateful for the opportunity to be together and we thank you for uh, the investment and the time that you're making with me as we uh, study this, uh, this, this great book, the Book of Books, and uh, determine as best we can and discover as best we can who uh, the one is that brought all things into being. Uh, and we know him as our father now because of the coming of his son and we know him in in so many so many ways so many great ways because all the attributes that he has are given to us uh, in in divine in his scriptures uh, the <clears throat> the word that uh, that i think will help us in really understanding who our father god is is the word providence and um, we introduced that word uh, several weeks ago in an attempt to try to understand his ways uh, what is he doing so in order to find out what he's doing now uh, what he's doing in our lives every day uh, as his as his people <clears throat> then we want to find out how he worked in biblical history and so we take that and then we translate that into any epic of history we're safe to say that he is unchangeable he's unalterable his nature is and his characteristics and attributes are truly the same in any age and any time we're safe to say whatever he is or whoever he is in the biblical story the biblical history of the 66 books that we have and then uh, that i have and maybe you have more but uh, that's what i think is the, is the canon of scripture in other words that that's who he is now and who he will be in the future you know, he's timeless so i've attempted to try to establish this attribute of our god called providence he sees all things before they occur he provides perfect direction for his eternal plan of redemption by preserving a righteous seed of the woman back in Genesis 3. Through the centuries of time, in humans he chooses the final culmination of his plan in the revelation of God the Son in human form of Jesus of Nazareth the Galilean. So throughout history, <clears throat> the creator God of the Bible has ordained, used, <coughs> worked through evil, to accomplish his purposes. Quoting Paul the Apostle, we've done this before. This is kind of like the, uh, the, I guess you might say, the skeleton of it, which we're going to put a lot of meat on in, the, in Romans chapter 30, Romans th uh, chapter 3, for from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. There's a word that I've come up with in the meantime, and the word is, uh, that try to okay, give us another word about this, goes with the word providence is concurrence <clears throat> the word concur in other words uh, our father god is working and everything is working according to his purpose there's no event in creation that falls outside his providence and he concurrently operates to accomplish his purpose through all human events and here's what a friend sent to me this week and uh, i really appreciate the input that uh, my brothers and sisters are giving to me in these teachings and it's very helpful God who exists without regard to limits of time and space and power or, or knowledge. He conceives, creates, manages, sustains, governs, judges, a lot of different words here. He uses all this for his purpose and glory. He governs all things, creates all things, manages all things, sustains all things. Without regard to the counsel or uh, the input of other, other beings as to what is their view, can they give him some sort of guidance or counsel? Uh, so all authority is his alone in heaven and on earth. Now, also this week, I came in touch with, I came in contact with another, with a Bible teacher, another Bible teacher that um, entertained another section of scripture that I want us to look at briefly on our way through this uh, idea of our Father God in all things and his providence and evil. That's what we dealt with last time. We tried to do this flyover in biblical history. And then, if you remember, we did that last week. We got all the way through the Old Testament. And we took personalities and we took from the very beginning in creation in the first humans. Then went through Adam, went through Eve, went through Abraham, went through. We just briefly touched about Joseph, briefly talked about Job, briefly talked about the prophets. And all of that then to paint the picture of how he's unfolding everything in progressive revelation to the coming of his son and three weeks ago we actually did that in acts chapter four and saw the, the great design that he revealed there 
in, in the death, resurrection, subsequent ascension. This section of scripture came to me this week from another source, a very valuable source, a very uh, creditable Bible teacher. So I want you to take your Bibles and wants to look at Colossians chapter 1. Keep in mind, we're still talking about the providence of our God and evil. That's kind of what we did last time and how he worked through evil, how he accomplished his purpose in spite of all the different uh, entities, the different uh, rulers, powers, and all those kind of things. The, in the case of our Lord, it was the judicial powers. It was the Roman power. It was, uh, it was the Jewish control and all that. All those things came up, brutally came against our, uh, our Lord. And um, through all that, uh, our Father God accomplished his purpose in him. All right, now turn to Colossians chapter 1. You're familiar with this section of Scripture, I'm sure. You probably read this many, many times. Let's look at it again, uh, afresh, hopefully, and anew. And maybe go a little bit farther than we have before. Uh, the Colossian letter, you know, the, the background about that. Paul had never been to this uh, church. He never visited with this church, but he had some real good friends that were involved in this church, and uh, they're named in this letter. So it's, it's a very significant letter, very important to us because it deals with a lot of the philosophies of that day, a lot of that a lot of the different ideologies that were bleeding into this congregation and he was he was writing this letter in answer to all these other heresies and all these other teachings that were beginning to influence the Christians in Colossae. Some people are gonna say that this section of scripture six this section of this letter and this section of the canon of scripture and the all of the scripture uh, is going to be one of the most uh, important and definitive um, characteristics of God the Son. It's not demeaning God the Father. In fact, it's actually giving us uh, some clear, very clear description of who God the Son is and his function in the Godhead throughout all eternity. But you read it yourself. You read the whole letter. If you don't, it's only four chapters. You read the whole letter, but uh, we're going to just focus in beginning in chapter 1, uh, verse, fi verse 15. We're going to try to take this one, one phrase at a time and make a few comments about it. Chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. The word image here in the New Testament is going to involve two ideas. It's going to involve representation and manifestation. These are kind of big words, but just come on now. Let's, let's think about these things. Let's use our human minds, and hopefully the mind of Christ is going to really be the teacher by his spirit, uh, representation so as the image of the invisible God and I think that's it going to be uh, it's going to be God the Father and God the Spirit now God the Son is the image is going to be the representation of the Godhead to uh, human history he is going to be the he's going to be the manifestation the the revelation, the perfect revelation, Hebrews 1 writer says it's going to be, he's going to be the exact representation, the exact manifestation of the Godhead. He is a perfect copy, a perfect duplicate. He himself says, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. And so there shouldn't be any argument, although there is. Some people want to make Jesus other than what he says he is, or what the scriptures say he is, but he is exactly, exactly who the father is, the image of the father in spirit and in truth, in the divine characteristics of God the Father. Look at the next phrase, the firstborn of all creation. This is a title of honor to be the firstborn of all things. If you're the firstborn of the family, that's a title of a, that's a title of respect. It's a title of birth order. It's a title of being the leader of the family and so on. So, But he has always been eternally the firstborn. It's what Athanasius said in response to the heretics of his day. There was never a time when he was not. He is God the Son, and He's eternal. So being the firstborn, we don't use that in the context of uh, human uh, progenitors. He is the firstborn, being the uh, supreme position of all things, heaven and on earth. Now look at verse 16. For by Him, or you may have uh, from Him, all things were created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created 
through him and for him. Let's just take that sentence right there. For by him or in him, all things were created. I'm just going to kind of stretch this a little bit, but that could sound a, light, sound a lot like from him in Romans 11, 36 that we talked about. And if, the, and if there is a connection here, the pronoun back in Romans 11, 36 for from him is not only a reference to God the Father, and you go look at the context, it's probably the word God is used there, but let's also think that that pronoun for from him includes God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then here in Colossians 1, we might think that God the Son is the conduit. It's the ave He is the avenue. Let's try to find words. He is the avenue, the conduit, the person, the word through whom God the Father brings all things into existence in the creation of time and space and matter and energy and plasma or any other discovered material that man may find. Uh, their spirit is the expression of the unity and the diversity of the Godhead, the cohesiveness, the complexity, and the interlocking dynamics of the Godhead that brings all things into existence. For by him, for in him, all things were created. Go all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, and you're going to see the work of in the beginning, God created the heavens and, and the earth. In a few, a few phrases next, you're going to see the Spirit hovered over the waters. You don't see a reference to God the Son, but the Hebrew there is a plural. In the beginning, God, Elohim, it's God the Father, God the Son, and of course, God the Holy Spirit mentioned the a few statements later. That's a powerful confirmation to, connect, to combine Genesis 1 with Colossians 1. And we see then that God the Son is the way, the means, uh, the avenue, the Word of God in John 1, through, through which all things, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and in the beginning all things uh, were brought into existence uh, through Him. This is the very same idea that the Apostle Paul had, the Apostle John had, by the Spirit of Christ that uh, Moses had when he wrote Genesis 1. For by him all things were created. Now look at the next phrase, in heaven, in the heavens and on earth. Now there's two dimensions there, but there are those who are going to say, and, and there probably are, there are other dimensions. There's heaven, the residence of our Father God, His Son, and all created beings, and uh, everything that's there that He has created. Um, you got heaven, and then you got heavens, which uh, is going to be probably talking about the atmosphere around the earth, and then all celestial bodies, seen and unseen. It's just everything else. And then earth. So according to the Bible, three dimensions that are so critically important to understand are heaven, heavens, and earth. By him, God the Son, in him, all things were created in the heavens and on earth. All right, now look at the next phrase, visible and invisible. And by the Spirit, Paul is talking about visible to the human eye, the naked eye, you might say, and those things that the human eye cannot see, that which we have seen or ever will see with the human eye through whatever device the human invents. And we're living in the early 21st century, and the humans have, humans have invented amazing devices in order to see things that are very microscopic and then see things that are way out in the universe. It's just really amazing, but we are amazed at our God as a creator through his son at what we see that we've never seen before. So this includes visible and invisible things, that which we have begun to see and that which has been invisible to us before. As I said, cellular organisms, celestial planets and galaxies, and for by him, in him, all things have been created in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Look at the next phrase in this translation, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. These are different dimensions of power or control. Now, when I suggest this, you let me know what you think. 
but we might think that this is only describing wickedness or anything that's anti-God, anything that's anti-Christ, anything that's anti the kingdom of God, anything that is working against what our Father God is, is accomplishing through His providence. The reason I say that and the reason I'm thinking that is because it's not the church. Because the church doesn't have any authorities or any rulers other than who? Christ our Lord, God the Son, who has been put by His Father as the head of the church, the body of Christ, universal and also uh, provincial, close by in this community and anywhere the church is. So we say then that he has created all things in heaven and on earth, visible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. The Father, our Father, has delegated all authority to his Son. Now that the Son has perfectly revealed the Father in time and space, matter and energy, the Son has taken his former position in the Godhead where the Father has given him a position of rule and authority and power, putting all things in subjection to his feet. That's in Ephesians 1, Colossians 2, next chapter. Through the human actions, through the actions of humans, with evil motives and intents and desires and ambitions, God the Father, through God the Son, by the action of God the Spirit, brings all things about to glorify him and accomplish their purpose. What you keep in mind now, this is evil stuff here we're talking about. This is evil. Providence of God and evil. These are thrones, principalities, powers, and as Paul says in Ephesians 6, darkness. He, he kind of uses these phrase, same phrases, the same words to talk about darkness. We want to keep in mind now that our Father, His Son, and their Spirit have no evil thoughts. He is not the originator or progenitor of evil nor is he the cause of evil. However, as I quoted earlier from a friend that sent me this week, he directs, uses, and ordains evil for his purpose. He has ordained evil, which would be used through the, through, to accomplish his purpose through willing choices of his creatures, the humans. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but that's what I think the Bible is teaching us. Thrones, principalities, powers, and darkness. All evil authorities, thrones, dominions, and rulers believe, they believe that they have the authority over life and death. They see themselves and the spirits that dominate them as having control of all things by determining who lives and who dies. That's a, that's a very powerful motivating influence in the affairs of, of humans because all people all humans fear death Hebrews chapter 2 now that God the Son has come listen very carefully now that God the Son has come and was resurrected from the dead after being brutally beaten to near death he has gained the authority over who lives and who dies by conquering the very thing that Satan used to control humans. Since his earthly life, including his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, he now has authority over all things in heaven and on earth, thrones, rulers, principalities, powers of darkness, whatever, all those evil things. He has now gained the authority. I want you to get this. He's now gained the authority over who lives and who dies by conquering the very thing. He conquered death, the very thing, that Satan uses to control humans. I, re I realize this brings up some very difficult questions because there has been a lot of death since the first death by the one who killed his brother. I mean, this is just, death by any means is horrible. A natural disasters, we're gonna be talking about that. Death by genocide, that's even more horrible, you would think, than natural disasters. Death by viruses, death by what we're dealing with now. I mean. And, and there are people, you say, that are innocent. We're going to deal with that too. So, our Father God has put His Son in authority over all things, even all things that are wicked. 
and he's given his, author, his son the authority over death because he's been resurrected from the dead. Now look at uh, verse 17. He is before all things. <clears throat> all right, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So if we take Romans 11, 36, we superimpose it here in Colossians 1, we see that he is the source of all things. All things have been created through him. We see now then in verse 17, in him all things hold together. Hold together. He is the sustainer. He is the uh, guide of all things going along with Romans 11. All things. Now listen to this statement. This is from J.P. Boyce in his book, Abstract Systematic Theology. Don't get all hot and bothered about all that. You know what the date on this is? 1888. I inherited this book. I'm so glad I have a copy of that. He says the exact same thing the Bible says, and there were people that said it before him, and then there's people who have been, been saying it after him. Listen to this. By acts of creation, God brings into existence the things which he makes and confers upon them their respective natures, qualities, properties, modes of existence, and laws of being, thought, and action. By acts of providence, he simply preserves these creations or permits or causes decay or change in them to such an extent and within such limits as he has purposed. And at the same time, in fulfillment of like purpose, he directs, controls, and guides them in accordance with the natures he has given them and the laws he has imposed upon them. If you want a copy of that, I'll send it to you. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it somewhere that you read it every day, along with what my, my other dear friend sent me too. It's the all-encompassing, superintending authority that our Father God has that he's given to us through his Son. Another Bible scholar, Bible Bible person has said, if there's one maverick molecule in the universe that's out of control, then God, our God is not God. Very similar in a newer way to say it as what I just wrote, uh, read to you. In a way, Romans 11, 36 is pretty much the same, I think, or you can see the, see the compatibility of those statements here and what is being written by Paul in Colossians chapter 1. And there's one more thing. In 18 through 20, he is the head of the body he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For he, it, was, it was the Father's good pleasure for all things, for all the fullness to dwell in him. That is, I think, all the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in him. And through him to recognize, reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now, I'm not going to say very much about that other than to say that that statement right there fits well into the goal of all things. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. He is the one who, through whom all things have been created, he is the one through whom all things hold together, and he is the one through whom all things will be reconciled to his Father. And we read 1 Corinthians 15 about that, and it clearly tells, Paul says, in there how that's all going to happen. That's Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, and how it fits with the providence of our Father God to accomplish all things through his Son by their Spirit and, and their Word. Now, next time we get together, I want us to continue to talk about the attributes or the qualities or the characteristics of our God. Now, providence has been the main 
quality you might the main attribute that our that our god possesses as his son as father son and spirit that, that that's been the one we focused on for several times several weeks now there's there are I, there are so many other attributes that our father god has his son his their spirit in his word we're not going to be able to cover them all there is another one though that i want us to look at that i think is very important for us to understand how he is any way connected with evil. The providence of our Father God by the work of his spirit through his son and how are they connected, related to evil. I've tried to say this over and over again. You're probably tired of me saying this and repeating these statements over and over. Let me just say this. Is, is your God too small? Now, some of you may have been reading the Bible for a long time. But you say, okay, well, I've heard that before. You know, there's nothing new to me. Just be careful about that mentality. Be careful about reading the Bible and say, I've heard somebody teach that before. I've read it before. I've taught it before. I've had the privilege to teach the Bible for 40 years, and I'm learning things like this over and new and fresh. If the scriptures are not fresh to you and your mind is not, your human mind is not challenged by the mind of Christ, I am concerned about your relationship with him. Are you, are you distracted from other things? Are you letting other things take the place of your hunger and thirst for the righteousness of his word? It goes back to Proverbs chapter 2. Do you cry out to him? Do you long for him? Do you wake up? Whenever you wake up from whatever shift your work you have or whatever time of rest you have, and do you think about him? Are you wanting to hear from him? Dear friend, I'm, this is a critical time. You know why it's critical? It's not because of the virus. It's got nothing to do with the virus. It's got to do with what you and I do today to find out what our Father, good is, Father God is doing. We thank you, Father, for the precious word you've left to us, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to see the beauty of your creation all around and to relish in uh, the magnificence of everything you've done. And Father, some of us have probably passed by creation so much. Now, we, we live in a concrete world. We live in a fluorescent lighting system where everything's lit up and really we don't i don't know i just uh, think we father need just to we need to get closer to you we need to plant a plant a uh, plant a garden right now i don't know that's kind of we need to put out flowers we need to love the things you've created and everything we do as i told my granddaughters today earlier everything we do we need to relate it back to who you are father we need to think about how does what who we are what we're doing here where we're going relate to uh, who you are as our Father. And we look forward to the next time we can meet again and help my dear friends who are listening to this and taking time to uh, listen and uh, learn from your word and help them to be blessed, Father. Just bless them real well and help them to be the, uh, the, uh, the voice, your word to others in their life. Help them to use conversations that they have. Uh, just casual conversations and in a way just kind of relate those conversations back to spiritual things I, I, too often fathers you know our minds are too much on the earth uh, I mean the earthly things you might say but um, help us to be have our heads in heaven where Christ is so that we'd be so powerfully used by you on this earth while we are still here we make these requests in your son's name I look forward to seeing you again real soon